Dave Hagler. Are we ready? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Could you all please rise up and join us for some music?
fun and frivolity and uh, home repair. Uh, so please keep them in, in, in your prayers, especially in light of the, um, uh, the heat wave that we've been experiencing in the last few days. Second thing is um, body language. Body language. Disinterested. Interested. <laughs> That's our topic. Uh, this Thursday at, at the Life Tree Cafe at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's back in our Beacon Cafe. But, um, uh, it's all about what we actually tell people before we even open our mouths. That was number two. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, no. <laughs> uh, are there any other important announcements? Uh, no, no, I'm looking around. No one's got any important announcements. So instead of important announcements, you get to stand up and turn to your neighbor and greet one another.
Can you hear me now? Yes. So would everybody like to take a seat for just a moment? Today we're starting yet uh, another uh, entry in our Live, It's Now Loving Generously series. And to introduce that to you today, we have the lovely Katie and Morgan. I knew that just like three seconds ago, too. That's the, all right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the new five-week journey of reimagining generosity. Once a month for the next five months, we'll join with the Donovan family discovering how to love generously. We hope and pray that these sessions will be a great blessing to you in your walk as a disciple of Christ. Yeah, we can't truly live generously unless we're willing to give ourselves to those Jesus talked about most, the poor, the needy, and the outcast. Loving generously overflows from the church into the larger community. The series we completed last month, Living Generously, challenged us to reassess our motives and discover how God wants us to live generous lives. In this series, we'll discover what it is to love and look forward to loving those who offer us nothing in return. Could everybody please stand up and join us? When the stars came crashing down in tiny pieces to the ground I was all alone down here, trapped beneath the atmosphere that I thought somebody called my name. I spun around and caught a flame, I gave it to a God I didn't know. And now everything is falling into place. A brand new life is called. to 
morning, everybody. Now, most of us, if we're honest, should or would or could acknowledge that the people we invite into our lives are the people who make us feel most comfortable. It's people that are a lot like ourselves. They may have different jobs and different personalities, but they tend to be like us in a lot of other ways. Maybe it's class, maybe it's race, maybe it's a cultural background. But a clique is not a community. Jesus modeled a redemptive community that reached across social barriers that tend to divide us. His own disciples were an odd collection of mismatched people, and it's unlikely that some of them would have chosen to spend their time with one another if Jesus had not invited each one by name to follow him. He ministered to people in power like Nicodemus in John 3, 1 through 17, and a Roman centurion, Matthew 8, 5 to 13, but he also spent lots of time with the ostracized and the powerless, people like Zacchaeus, the tax collector, Luke 19, 1 through 10, who would have been wealthy but was despised as a traitor. He spent time with the woman caught in adultery, John 8, 1 through 11, and with the disabled and demon-possessed, Matthew 9, 27, 31, and 12, 22. The first step toward relational generosity is recognizing that we have a problem. Last week, Pastor Carr talked about the fact that we have to name it, claim it, and live it. Meaning that we have to name our sins, we have to claim the forgiveness and salvation that Jesus offers, and then we have to live as a saved people. And so admitting we have a problem with generosity is naming it. Our relationships do not look much like Jesus' relationships. And our community, at least for most of us, does not look like his community, where cultural and social and economic barriers were far less important than our common human needs. But the gospel shows amazing generosity by inviting every sinner into fellowship with God Gospel living shows the same generosity to others. Let's check in with the Donovan family and Ray to help us understand how our Lord desires us to live beyond our comfort zones.
kind of makes sense to invite the people that benefit benefits, right? So basically, it's like a metal detector, but only it finds plastic. You know what I'm saying? But what would you find with it? What do you mean? Plastic. I met Frank almost uh, four years ago at, at the kitchen. Excuse me. This is Thomas and his fiance Julia. We've enjoyed getting to know them in the kitchen. It's great to meet you, Thomas. Yeah, you too. Oh, I'm sort of the official handshaker for us. I am so oh, sorry. It's okay. I saved tons of money on hand sanitizer. <laughs> Cassie, may I ask you for a moment, please? Oh, Victoria, I'd like to. I'm sorry, dear. Um, I'm afraid I won't be able to stay for dinner, but you can put me up for my usual donation. Oh, thank you. But I'm sorry that you have to leave so soon. I'm not exactly sure why things were changed this year, but you should probably know that a few people feel a little ambushed by how this was done. Ambushed? I just thought you wanted to know. Aren't you staying for dinner? Not for me. I'm sorry to hear that. Did we do something to upset you? I don't see no name card says Chuck. That's a good point, Chuck. But I don't see a car here with anyone else's name on here, do you? No, sir, I suppose I don't. Chuck, from the looks of it, we are going to have a plan. To go around. So, would you please join me? Hey, Frank and Cassie, thank you. It was a great evening. Y'all take care. Take care. Drive safe. What a lovely evening. Yeah. <laughs> Something wrong, Frank? I was just thinking about people who left earlier tonight. But hey, more food for us, right? <laughs> you know, some people only want to sit at tables when every seat is reserved for people like themselves. When you want real community. You got to rip up name cards. And prepare to get your hands dirty. I know a thing or two about getting my hands dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Now you know why we hated to lose Ray as a gardener. Oh, yeah. Julia, is something wrong, dear? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> Say what's on your mind. You're among friends here. It's just that I haven't been a part of many meaningful relationships lately. Except Thomas, of course. <laughs> Thomas is about the only healthy thing in my life. Julia lost her apartment today. Um, it's a long story, but we're trying to figure out how to deal with some people who think that they get to decide what table Julia sits at. I know that there's a lot there that won't be solved right now, but Frank and I might be able to help out in some small way. We have a guest house that we would love for you to use for as long as you need it. Uh, no, I, I couldn't. No, uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Donovan. Um, but, no, hold on, Thomas. I know you can't see my wife right now, but if you could, you'd know not to mess with her. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we insist. Especially knowing God will be. So I'm
14, uh, verses 12 through 14. And he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors. For they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Consider that the Pharisees of Jesus' day were not merely religious teachers, but also highly influential leaders of the Jewish people. When Jesus said that we should invite the, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, he was attending a feast in the home of a particularly prominent Pharisee. The other guests were competing for signs of respect and honor. James warns the early church about giving preference in the same way. Show no partiality. You pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. It's not hard to imagine parallels in our own culture. Public gatherings and meals in particular have always been places where social hierarchies become visible. Even when we were children, school cafeterias made excruciatingly clear who was popular and who was not. As adults, we see that galas and benefits often have a head table on stage and VIPs near the front. At business parties, employees often angle to sit near the chief executive or want to be seen talking to the company's most important clients. You see, Jesus' vision is very, very different. The kingdom of God overturns our worldly social order. Those who look upon themselves with a sense of pride and entitlement will be humbled, while those who look upon themselves with humility and repentance will be exalted. So Jesus tells the prominent Pharisee in verses 12 through 14 that he shouldn't invite the relatives and rich neighbors and the poor, and, and, but the poor, the crippled, the, the lame, the blind. We know from John 9, 2, that many in Jesus' time would have assumed that the crippled, the lame, and the blind were suffering the punishment of God for their sins or, or for the sins of their, of their parents. So Jesus is encouraging his host to invite not only the poor and the needy, but even those whom the culture despises and condemns. Think about the following questions and see if any of them make you uncomfortable. Number one. Why don't we do what Jesus encourages his host to do? Think about when you're at a wedding. Who sits where during the reception? Or what about worship on Sunday? Who sits up front? When we hear about the social ranking in Luke 14, can you think of situations where we seat people according to their social ranking and importance today? What are other ways that we display social ranking? So what are some of the reasons that you think Jesus said that we should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind instead of your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors? If we actually did what Jesus says, regularly inviting the least of those into our lives, what kind of an effect might that have on us? And I'm going to interject. One of the things that, that we do on our VIM trips um, is throughout the week, the, the residents are invited uh, to share dinner with us. Uh, they have their choice of, of days. Uh, they, come, they come over, uh, they, they enjoy dinner with us, uh, they enjoy the program with us, and we get to know a little bit more about one another that we wouldn't have actually learned if it was just us serving them during the daytime. Uh, the fact that we can kind of let our guard down, let our hair down a little bit, and spend some time breaking bread, as we've talked about here in the past, uh, brings out a, a whole different uh, dynamic uh, that helps us all to, to, to learn from one another. If we are believers and call ourselves Christ followers, what's holding us back from being the disciples Christ calls us to be? Continuing in Luke 14, 
Jesus tells a story about a different kind of banquet host. The host invites many guests, but those who are invited do not appreciate the invitation. They make a series of lame excuses, and the owner of the house grows angry. He asks his servant to invite the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Eventually, he's literally inviting people off the streets. He vows that those who were invited, but who took the gift for granted, will never taste the banquet. In the film we watched this week, Frank and Cassie are about to host the benefit banquet for the soup kitchen. Hearing Luke 14, 12 through 14, they decide to invite the people that the benefit benefits, the homeless people who frequent the soup kitchen, to join the well-to-do. When the helpers and the helped were put together in a single room, some of the helpers felt uncomfortable. One of the usual donors, Victoria, pledges a donation that says some of the guests feel ambushed. Once upon a time, Frank himself had responded similarly. But God has already brought him on a journey. He went from making a, a comfortable financial sacrifice to picking up a ladle and actually serving folks. Now he's ready to go even further and invite the poor and the needy into his world, into his life. When one of the men arrives, a sanitation worker named Chuck finds the, a, a table full of name cards, but he can't find his name. As Frank begins to tear up the, the name cards, he's also tearing down the walls that had excluded people like Chuck. I'd like you to consider this. From, from this parable, Jesus has us change our perspective in who is in and who is out. When we help others, do we see them as, as projects or do we actually see them as honored guests? When we minister to others in the community, are we more comfortable giving for their need or inviting them into our lives, assisting them with their need? In the film we watched this week, the soup kitchen guest Chuck considers leaving the fundraiser because he doesn't see a name tag for himself on the table. Frank rips up several other name tags. He then says, I don't see a card with anyone else's name on it either. How does Frank's action mirror the story of the parable? Later in the evening, Ray notes, some people only want to sit at tables where every seat is reserved for people like themselves. You want real community? You have to rip up the name cards. How does it help to form genuine community when we invite people from all walks of life to an open table? I invite you now to hear more from Ray. When I was homeless, there wasn't a table in the world with my name on it. In the time when I most needed community, I was uninvited and unwelcome because everyone was uncomfortable at the sight of the pain and poverty and need in my life. That's when I first heard Jesus' words. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends, brothers, relatives, or rich neighbors, but invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. We all do. Rich or poor. Those 
mostly have nothing to offer but their needs. Maybe it's time to rip up the name cards in your life and reach out to someone with no place to sit and rejoice if you find that they have no way to repay you because God says you will be blessed. So, who can you invite to your table today? Just some closing thoughts. <clears throat> Jesus himself showed extraordinary generosity in inviting all of us to his table. The proper response for all of us begins with gratefully receiving the grace of God and claiming it, but that very gratitude should express itself in showing the same extraordinary generosity to others and live it. Have a blessed week, everyone. Let's take a quick moment here to lift our hearts up to the Lord, remembering that uh, he's very generous to us as well. So let's bow our, our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your generosity towards us, how you reach out to us without discrimination and see us for who we are. We also want to lift up our prayers to you this morning. I'd like to lift up um, the Mackey and Parson family. That is, um, Colby and Greg lost their uncle uh, this week. His name was uh, Ken Mackey, and the funeral is tomorrow. And uh, if you could keep Jerry, it was Jerry Knowles' family, in your prayers, please. Mm -hmm. uh, prayers for Kathy Sears, is her mother entered. I'd like to say a prayer for my, my boys, Godfather, Todd Ron. He uh, lost his father and he's in a very, very hard, difficult place right now. So no some prayers for that. I'd like to offer a prayer for for the students that we are helping with compassionate kids. Each is probably part of a larger family, but their names are George, Trinity. for someone who was in my wedding 23 years ago and passed away way too early about a week ago. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come to you and lift up these prayers and concerns to you and that you hear us. We also want to lift up the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Everyone, please stand up and join us for some music. <laughs>
I'm pretty sure that guy's a plant. <laughs> Go home and have a great week. <laughs>